Wow, good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen? Amen. I am excited this morning. We've got a first-time visitor here today that has never been in church before. And she is two weeks old. Is that right? A brand new addition to the family of God right over here. It's exciting, David and Nikki and their little girl, Alana. I'm saying that right, Alana? Beautiful little girl, beautiful little girl. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. But we are continuing our, our series on the book of Galatians. And today we find ourselves in Galatians chapter 6, the last chapter of Galatians. And um, it's interesting as we go through this, it's very Very easy for us to come to the conclusion that things were going crazy in the town of Galatia. Things were getting out of hand. And um, it's interesting as I look at what was going on with Galatia, we got people coming from one direction, the other direction, and all these battles happening inside of the church. Um, It's just interesting to see how this plays out and the point that Paul would even write to them and say, you are foolish, you foolish Galatians. And so in my home, we have a television, as most Americans do, right? We actually have two TVs in our home. One TV actually gets TV channels. And that TV is pretty much reserved for sports. That's what we watch on that. It's, it's in what we call the cave. And we, watch, we go out there to watch sports and maybe a movie once in a while. In our actual home, we have a television, but it doesn't get TV channels because we don't want to spend the money to pay for TV because we really don't get a chance to watch TV. So what we do is something like Netflix. And we watch religiously in our show, in our home, pretty much there's a show that we watch over and over. My kids have seen every episode at least three times, and that's called Duck Dynasty. And you guys have probably seen Duck Dynasty. And I love it. I love that my kids watch it. It's a wholesome show. It's a Christian family who bases all their values on the Word of God, and they just make sure that God is seen throughout every part. But that is a reality TV show is another reason why I like to watch it. And I've often asked myself this question. How would South Peoria Baptist Church work as a reality show? I would love it. You know, I love, if you love your church, say amen. 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 I love South Peoria Baptist Church. I love going to church here. I love working here. I get to work with some of the most amazing people in the world. I get to serve some of the most amazing people in the world, and we just get to do life together. But if you've ever gone through our offices on like a Monday morning or Tuesday morning, there's just times in our week where our office just turns like into this whirlwind of activity, and it's exciting. It's a fun time. We laugh together. We cry together. We pray together. We do all kinds of stuff. And I've always wondered, what would it look like to be a reality TV show at South Peoria Baptist Church, to capture the true personality of our pastor and the staff for the world to see? And that would be fun. But the truth is, reality shows are usually successful not for the wholesomeness and and, and the purity behind it. They're usually successful for the chaos and the dissension and the dysfunction, right? And I think if we were to actually take the church at Galatia, they would probably be one of the top reality shows on TV because of everything that was going on in the church. You have these group of, a group of men called the Judaizers. And what they were doing is they were actually Jews who had been saved out of Ju- Judaism and had become Christians. And the church is brand new. It's just now happening. There had been no church before. It was all the Jews going to the, t- to the temple. And now there's this brand new thing in Christianity called the church And they were coming together, and they're trying to figure out how it works together. And the Jews didn't know how church should work, so they brought with them the way they thought it should work, which was the law and circumcision. The problem was there was other people becoming Christians, and they weren't under the law and circumcision. And so there's like these battles of the way church should be done and the way church shouldn't be done and these accusations and dysfunctions and all of these things happening. And I can kind of relate to that. Even in this room today, we all come here with history from church, whether good, bad, indifferent, but we all walk into this room every Sunday with an idea of how church should be done. And sometimes we're vocal about it, sometimes we're not vocal about it, but it got to the point in Galatia where they were fighting over this. They had lost their focus on what the church was supposed to be doing, and they had become inward focused about the way that they were supposed to be doing it. It was a really sad state of affairs. So we find Paul writing this letter to the church at Galatia, and he's having to address all kinds of craziness. Don't be fools. Quit adding to the gospel. Don't go around asking people to get circumcised. This is not what the Bible says. You know what the truth is. You know what the gospel is. And I think as we look at that, we realize something. We realize they had lost their focus. And what I'd like for us to do before we read Galatians chapter 6, just so that we have the same foundation, the same basis of what Paul was writing from, is to find a look, take a look at what Paul's foundation and focus of what the church should be. 
and it actually comes from Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 28, it's the last chapter of Matthew, we find Jesus addressing the disciples for the last time. It's one of the most famous passages in the Bible. We call it the Great Commission, right? And he comes to the disciples, and they're sta he's standing there with them, and they have followed him for over three and a half years. They have seen him raise the dead. They have seen him heal the sick and the lame, do miraculous things, cast out demons. They saw him conquer death on the cross and defeat sin. And now, he's getting ready to ascend into heaven, and he's got his final message for them. And this is how it begins in verse 18. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Think about that. Let that set in for a second. All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. The creator of the universe the one who spoke creation into being at the speed of light, Jesus, who walked with Adam and Eve, Jesus, who conquered sin and death on the cross, Jesus, who conquered death with grace and love through his salvation. And the last thing he's going to sum up, he is reminding the disciples, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, He's taking all of that authority and he's pouring it into one purpose and one mission. He says, all of the authority I've been given, therefore, you go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The creator of all the universe brings all of his authority over nature, over supernatural beings, over heaven, and pours it into the purpose of the church. It's beautiful. And these disciples go out, and they start, through the power of the Holy Spirit, start spreading the gospel, and the Christian church is born. And it's a movement. It's alive, and it's supernatural, and it's amazing. In fact, if we go back a few chapters to chapter 16, we see a conversation with Jesus and Peter, and Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, who do people say that I am? And he's like, well, people say you're Elijah and Moses and all these other things. And then, and then he says, but Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter believes in his heart and then confesses with his mouth, you are the Messiah. You're the Son of God. And Jesus says this, blessed are you, Peter, because God has shown you this. And on this rock, not Peter, but on the rock of the gospel, on the confession of faith that Peter just made, on his profession and believing in his heart that Jesus is Lord and the confessing with his mouth, on that rock of the gospel, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. They will not overcome it. Amen? Can we get an amen to that? Here's the problem. You guys ready? Who in this room has been attacked by a gate before? One or two of us? Okay. All right. Gates are defensive. They're defensive. The only way we get hurt by a gate is if we charge it. He is saying, this is my church built on the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is, and the gates of hell are not going to overcome it when we charge the gates of hell. And how are we going to charge the gates of hell? We're going to go into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all the things that Jesus has commanded. That is the purpose of the church. Do you remember the first time? Do you remember when you understood who Jesus was for the first time? When your life came face to face with the glory and grace of Christ, and you realized in that moment, I am a sinner. I can't, I'm not good. Only, I, there's nothing I can do to get to God. But Jesus is grace and love, and he paid the price for me. Do you remember your moment of salvation? And the, what happened when the Holy Spirit came into your life and filled you as a new creation? Do you remember? Do you remember the excitement? 
See, something happened there in that moment that is supernatural and mysterious. See, not only were you individually saved from your sins into salvation, but each of us were saved from our sins into the body of Christ, into the church, into what he calls and refers to most often. He doesn't very, very often call it the church. He calls it his bride. And each of us were saved into this bride that each of us make up a part of this beautiful thing called the bride of Christ. And it's supernatural. And it's amazing. And the focus that we have going forward is to be on storming the gates of hell with the gospel and baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, saving, from the, saving the world for, who is already dead. The Bible tells us we were dead already. We were walking around thinking we were alive, but we were dead until the creation, the new creation was created in us through the Holy Spirit. And we take that and we rip the gates of hell open and we share the gospel and the Holy Spirit begins to fill the lives of people who are spiritually dead and they come to life breathing in that for the first time. And then you get excited. Do you remember? You didn't know how to say it in words. You probably talked to family or friends. You experienced Jesus. You accepted his, his salvation. You became a brand new Christian. You were filled with the Holy Spirit. And you were just energized with the Holy Spirit. And you didn't know how to focus it. And you're running around telling everybody. Oh, well, you didn't know the words, right? Do you remember this? And it's like, Jesus loves me. And Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves. And, he, and I'm a sinner. And, and I call it throwing up the gospel because we're so excited about who Jesus is. We don't really, we're, we're brand new Christians. We're just excited about who he is. And we have so much energy. We want to charge those gates by ourselves. And we want to deliver that. And all of a sudden, our focus, and we're, we're born as a new creation, ready for that focus. And then sometimes we lose it. And that's what's going on in the church of Galatia. And it's crazy. And it gets crazy bad. And Paul is writing feverishly, trying to set this straight. So we're going to read this today. If you'll stand with me. Galatians chapter 6, as we look at this, and this is what it says. This pours right out. If you were here last week, we went through the fruit of the Spirit in chapter 5. This pours right out. This, there's no break here. This goes right out of the fruit of the Spirit, going, okay, here's what the fruit of the Spirit is. You know, self-control, gentleness, kindness, peacefulness. All these things pour in, and this is how the church should behave. So listen to this. It says, brothers and sisters, verse 1, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If any of you think you are something when you are nothing, you are deceiving yourselves. Each of you should test your own actions. Then you can take pride in yourself without comparing yourself to somebody else. For each of you should carry your own load. Nevertheless, those who receive instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow, and those who sow to please their sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. And those who sow to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just pray in this moment that your spirit fills this place, that your Holy Spirit examines our hearts and pulls back the parts of our hearts that are hardened so that we can see how we become more like you and focused on your purpose. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's important as we dive into this for us to understand Paul is writing this to the church people in Galatia. He's not writing this to the non-church people. He's not writing this to the business people. He's writing this to the church people. So when we get into parts of the scripture, it's like, man, those people are messed up. That's the church people. That's the church people, right? And to be honest with you, I love South Peoria Baptist Church, but I'm messed up, right? I got some baggage with me. And so when we come into this supernatural thing of the church, we all bring that baggage in with us and that stuff with us. In fact, the very, first, the very first verse in here tells us one thing that we need to get down. The church has sin in it, and it's contagious. Our church has sin in it, and that sin is contagious. See, it says right here, verse 1, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, right? But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. That's crazy. 
but it's true. In fact, if you don't have sin in your life, I'm going to cordially ask you right now to please leave because you make me uncomfortable. We're all messed up in this room. And we come together as the perfect bride of Christ, even though we got sin in our life. And we do get caught up in that. In fact, the, the previous chapter 5, just six verses earlier, they, they expresses what this looks like. See if this, see if this describes you or me, whatever. We can see how it goes. Hatred, discord, jealousy, it's a rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Happens in our church because we're sinful, but we're a family. See, we're a family. When we become part of the supernatural bride of Christ, we are born into a family of God. That's who we eat. I've been blessed with an awesome family. I really have. I haven't been blessed with a perfect family. I've been blessed with an awesome family. I grew up with two brothers, and they were great. Loved them dearly. We fought a lot, and we dealt with it. Like in that second, we dealt with it. One of us would hit the other one or bite the other one or do something and yell, and, and then it was over, right? We ha I, had, I had life figured out at that point. You get upset with somebody, you punch them, and then you walk on, and everybody's happy. Then I got married. Never punched my wife. That's not what I said. <laughs> but I got married, and I realized very quickly, things don't just get over. Things are different. The way I thought the world worked with my brothers doesn't work with my wife. We can get upset with each other, and the next morning, i got to wake up and talk about it. And so there, there's something different there. We have to work through it, and I work through it because I love my wife. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life bitter at my wife because she hurt my feelings on one day. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down with her in a healthy way, and then we're going to express that to each other, and we're going to work through it. It's the same thing that happens in the body of Christ. As we come together, our feelings can get hurt, especially when we come in and we think church should be done one way or this way or that way or this person said something this way or, or I got it this way, and all of a sudden things happen, and we fall into a pattern of sin. Maybe it turns into gossip. Maybe it turns into factions and dissension. And we start drawing a line and saying, well, this person's on my side and that person's on that side over there. And Paul's saying that can have nothing to do with the church. It's going to happen. But you've got to figure out how to work with it. And this is how he says to work with it. For those of you that are godly, for those of you who are godly, you go to that person and you gently set them on the right path. Not me when I'm in anger, not when I'm upset with you. I, 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 can't, I can't spiritually fix my issue with you if I come to you with anger and point out your sin because you're going to turn around and point out my sin. And then we're going to try and figure out who has the biggest sin and that person's wrong, right? No, God, this is Paul saying, look, here's the problem. When somebody is sinning and they fall into this, and this is awesome right here. It says when somebody finds, the, the, the meaning behind this passage is like when they're surprised because if you love your church, say Amen. None of us come in and go, we want to hurt our church today. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to hurt my family today. But sometimes we fall into a place and we're surprised that we find ourselves there. And that's what this is referring to. Sometimes we're going to wake up and we're going to be surprised of where we've landed and realize I've, I've done something wrong. And then somebody who's godly needs to come inside along me and help me fix that. But here's the temptation. It gives a warning against this, and this is where it becomes contagious. So be careful, or you will be tempted to fall into the same sin. The most destructive sin to a church is gossip. And it's so easily spread. I mean, it gets funny in churches. Like, I've got a prayer request. Sure. We need to pray for this person because they're messed up. And I'm upset with them right now. And it's like, that's not, that's gossip. That's using, that's using something that's godly and using gossip to push it forward. That's not right. And Paul's saying, no, we've got to make sure we're protecting ourselves because we, love, we do love each other. We do. Amen? And when you're hurting, I want to come to your house. I want to sit with you and go, brother, what's going on? Why are you hurting? And then you want to share with me why you're hurting. And if I'm like, man, I love you. That's wrong. And all of a sudden, I'm getting sucked into something that's not right, right? That could be completely, completely hurt, harmful to our church if, if, we, if, we're, if we're gossiping about something that isn't being handled. And so as Paul says, okay, sin's going to happen in the church. People who are godly need to go and help set those people who are sinning 
back on track. But they need to be careful. We need to be careful to make sure we don't fall into the same sin. So sin is in our church, and it's contagious, so we have to guard against it. Point number two is we are in this all together. We are all in this together. This is the beautiful thing about being part of the bride of Christ, the part of the church. This is awesome. Verse chapter two, or verse two, chapter six, says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If any of you think you are something when you are nothing, you deceive yourselves. Each of you should test your own actions. Then you can take pride in yourself without comparing yourself to somebody else. For each of you should carry your own load. Nevertheless, those who receive instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. So this is what this is saying. I, I love this part. God did not create us to do life alone. He created us to be part of his bride and for all of us to carry each other's burdens. You're my family, and I'm your family. And if something happens in my life, if I lose my job, if you lose your job, I'm going to go through it with you. If you get sick, we're going to go through it with you. If something's happening in your family, we're going to go through it with you because that's what we do as family. God has got us together so we can all depend on each other as we're storming the gates of hell. So we come together as his people, as his beautiful bride, and we work through it together, and the burden is all ours. Right? Verse 3 goes on to say, if any of you think you are something when you are nothing, you deceive yourselves. And what this is basically meaning, it says, that is everyone's role. You cannot be a bystander in church. You cannot just be a spectator in church. You are either part of the church or you're not part of the church. You don't have the right just to come and sit in a chair. Because God paid the price for each of us to be saved into his family. And we do this together. If we're not doing it together, we're not storming the gates of hell efficiently. We're not doing it the way we should be. If we're not being obedient, then we're not doing what God has called us to do and we're losing our focus. Christ has saved us from our sins into salvation in his family and his beautiful bride. And each of us have a place. Each of us have to carry. It goes on. This is such a beautiful balance here. It says all of our burdens are carried together so we do not have to bear it alone. But each of us must carry our own weight because we're responsible for our own actions. And there in, there in that balance, there is no one greater than the other. Don't judge yourself against what somebody else is doing. You work for Christ. Don't judge your, your effectiveness based on somebody else. You work for Christ. And as we come together, there's this beautiful, supernatural thing of the church beginning to come alive. The third thing we need to look at today is we will reap what we sow. Verses 7 through 10 say this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow. I'm going to go back. I'm going to read this again. But I want us to understand very heavily. He's writing to the church people about the church people. So let's, let's listen to this in that context. Let's read this in that context. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow. Those who sow to please their sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And those who sow to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest, and if we do not give up, therefore... As we have opportunity, let us do good to all the people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. In church, in this beautiful thing of a bride, we have to be careful not to lose our focus on what we're supposed to be. Because if we lose our focus on what we're supposed to be, we just become a good place doing good things. No different than the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA. And we're doing them for the wrong reasons. And what it's saying right here is we will reap what we sow. We will reap what we sow. And for those of us that, are, that just come in under our own desire to do good things and just do good things to do good things, we're not going to sow anything. It's going to be in destruction. God did not design the church to do good things. He designed the church to overcome the gates of hell. Overcome the gates of hell. And when we focus on that, 
what happens when we sow the seed that proceeds to constantly attack the gates of hell. What we actually reap, did you catch it in there? What we actually reap as the church, as we work diligently, diligently at the right time, we are going to reap eternal life. We're going to come together and we're going to be a church that reaps eternal life because our community is experiencing the gospel through us. They're not experiencing our programs. They're not experiencing the good times. They're experiencing Jesus. And there's a warning in here. This is what Paul is saying. Look, guys, Galatia, you guys are way out of whack in the way that you're doing things. You've completely lost your focus. And now it's time to refocus on what a church is supposed to be like. This is what it is. Number one, this is how you work together. you got to be careful because there's sin in the church, and it can be contagious if you don't deal with it. But the good news is we're all in this together. We're all in this together. And we're going to carry each other's burden. We're going to live life together. And we're going to work together because each of us are going to, along with being in this together, are going to carry our own weight. And all the needs are going to be met. And then we're going to reap eternal life. And South Peoria is going to be a place where eternal life is found just blossoming out of the dirt of the earth. That's what the church should look like. That's the way it comes together. So this morning, this passage calls for a verdict on our hearts. It calls for a response in who we are in Christ, individually and as a church. Individually, maybe this morning, if you examine your heart, you may find your place surprised that you're caught up in sin. That you may have been a part of something that's gossiping about somebody else. Or you have bitterness in your heart towards somebody or you've drawn some lines and some factions inside of the church. And we know that nobody wants to be that. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wakes up with intention to hurt our church, to hurt the church. But sometimes we get hurt and our response isn't of God. Those things happen. If that's, if that's you this morning, if you find yourself, the good news is there's repentance and we're a family and we move on. And so this morning, if that's you, if, God's, if that's the verdict God is laying on your heart is that you need to repent from that, I encourage you this morning, make it right with God. Make it right with God. Erase those things that are going on underneath the, underneath the surface so that we can be healthy as a church. Number two, it may be that as we look at this and we're in this all together, we haven't been carrying our weight. We haven't been carrying our weight. You see, it's interesting as you look at this. God has called each of us to the body of Christ to be active, to be in this, and to be completely sold out for this purpose. The question we have to ask, the verdict on our heart is, are we carrying our weight in that? Are we completely sold out to the mission of Christ? If Christ has poured all the authority under heaven and earth into this church, into his, into his bride, are we sold out to that? Or is church just something we do? It happens between Mondays. It, fulfill, it fills time on the weekend. And it's not actually the passion of our heart through our Savior. If that's you this morning, I encourage you at this point in a little bit, our, our leader's going to be up here. We're going to sing a song of invitation. Come down to the altar and get your heart right with Christ. Because as our church begins to function health, health, healthily together, we can storm the gates of hell and they will be overcome. And it may be this morning that you've lost the vision and the purpose for what God has called us that we've lost it. This happens. I'll tell you, I've been in ministry for 12 years now, and it's very easy to get caught up in the programs, being a Sunday school teacher, being a deacon, being a music leader, being a youth pastor. It's very easy to get caught up in the things that I do and lose focus on the reason that I do them. And I find that when I've lost the focus on the reason that, I've done, that I'm doing it, when I've lost focus on the fact that we're supposed to come together and, and, and just charge the gates of hell, is when I become open to sin. I become open to being tired. I become open to being distracted, and it's no longer about working for God. It's now about being a good Sunday school teacher or a good deacon or a good worship leader or a good youth pastor, and I've completely lost my focus. Those are all good things, but God didn't call us to do good things. He called us to be on charge, on focus for what he has. And it may be here this morning as we talked about what it's like to experience becoming a new creation for the first time. 
when that Holy Spirit breathes life into you because you've come face to face with Christ and you've accepted that salvation. If that's you this morning and you haven't experienced what it is to become that new creation and have eternal life with Jesus, I'm going to encourage you in just a few minutes, our pastor's going to be standing down here in the front. We're going to sing a song. I encourage you in boldness to stand up, come to the front, and ask the pastor, can you tell me how to know Jesus? And he will full-heartedly right there share with you how you can today come face-to-face with Jesus. But in this moment right now, I'm just going to pray. Our musicians are going to come, and I'm going to ask God to examine us as a church and our, our hearts individually and ask him to show us what the verdict is that we need to pass on our own hearts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this morning. God, and I thank you for the gift of South Peoria. I thank you for what it's meant in my life and my family's life and in my children's life. It's where they grow to know you closer. It's where they learn scripture. God, it's an amazing place, and I thank you for the people that we, that we know and have come into relationship with here. God, I pray right now as we come before your, your throne, God, that you look at our hearts individually and as a church, that you examine these areas that we've talked about. Is there selfishness in our heart, God? Is there gossip? Is there greed? Is there factions? Is there bitterness? God, show us if that's happening. Lead us to repentance on that. God, examine our hearts and see if we are fully sold out to your mission, that we are fully a part of what's happening at South Peoria Baptist Church. God, if we are just a spectator on this moment right now, use your spirit to move us to a place where we know we need to become all in at your church and live fully for you. And God, I pray right now just as a church, as, a, as our leadership, as our, as, as our teachers, as our deacons, as all of our workers, our pastor, our staff, God, that you just focus us on your purpose and your goal. God, this is a place, a stronghold that destroys gates of hell, that life comes into Peoria and Glendale and Phoenix and Arizona and our world because we are constantly charging with the gospel. God, I pray right now in this moment, if there's someone in this room right now that does not know you personally, God, that you give them the boldness and the strength in this moment to come forward and meet you face to face. Speak to one of our leaders and speak to one of our pastors and say, I just want to know Jesus. So God, we ask for you in this moment, examine us. Pass the verdict on our heart. Bring us back to a focus in who you are. And we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Will you stand?